So what we're going to talk about today, a couple of topics. One is interference between stations and how you can deal with it. Uh, if you've got more than one transmitter on the air, uh, potentially there's some issues there. So we'll talk a little about how to how to minimize those issues. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, physical and site safety. And then we're going to talk RF exposure safety. And the RF exposure is actually good news when I, I'll, I'll show you because I've actually run some numbers. This will not be a this will not be a how to calculate it talk. This is going to be how to set it up so that you're safe talk. So let's talk first with uh, about uh, uh, tackling crossband interference. Uh, there are really two sources of potential problem. The first is on the transmit side, and that is harmonics, spurs, and phase noise coming out of the transmitter. The second is on the receive side, and that is receivers overloading from clean signals that are just strong. So let's start with clean transmitters. Back, uh, this slide came from, oh gosh, probably 10, 15 years ago. Uh, Rob Sherwood, uh, NC0B, who many of you may know, uh, oh, actually, okay, 13 years ago. Uh, he uh, He's done a lot of testing on receivers over the years and rating them and looking at their performance in terms of how they handle strong signals uh, on the same band and strong signals very close in. Uh, it's called dynamic range. And uh, he had one of his members uh, uh, test some transmitters and they said, basically, they said, let's see what happens when we put two signals on the same band, maybe about, you know, 100 kilohertz apart, as you might have with a sideband station and a CW station, for example. And I think they did the test on 20 meters. And the difference between the best and the worst rig at that time when they measured it was 20 dB. That's like a factor of 100. Um, well, since then, um, you may have heard of the ARRO's Clean Signal Initiative. And that Clean Signal Initiative is, is uh, basically looking to uh, keep our transmitted signals as clean as possible. And guess who's doing a lot of the work? Well, Rob Sherwood again with a couple of other hams. So I contacted uh, Rob and he provided me with kind of the latest research that they've got. Um, so what I'm going to do, let's see if we've got, there it is, okay. So here's a couple of things. First, uh, in general, uh, make sure you turn your speech processors down or off. Um, you, you don't need those for field day. Use good microphone technique, which usually means talking across the mic rather than directly into it, especially if you're using a handheld mic. And if you're running uh, digital modes, you don't need full power. So try and keep those down a little bit. And, uh, you know, your your rig may be a, may be a little happier. Uh, and remember the maximum power output is 100 watts. So if you've got a rig that does 150, you need to turn it down to stay within the rules. But here's the informa information I got from Rob. Uh, this is uh, their testing of uh, a number of, of transceivers. Um, and they're looking at if, if another signal is, you know, how much signal are you putting out 10 kilohertz away and 20 and 100. And you can see some of the best, like here's the Apache 7000. Um, 10 kilohertz away, it's minus 145 dB. Well, that's really good, okay? And it goes down and down from there. And here you see some like the IC7300, Flex 1500. These are down in the 110, 115 dB range. So there's a huge difference there. Even 20 kilohertz away, even 100 kilohertz away, the difference between, say, uh, uh, running an Elecraft K3S, um, which is minus 143 dB, and I see 7300, which is 106 minus 116 dB. So there's uh, there's over 25 dB of difference in performance. That's how much uh, composite noise is being put out off the regular transmitted signals, but in the same band. So picking your rigs uh, can be important. On the receive side, of course, uh, you want receivers with good, what we call close in dynamic range. And you look at some of the top performers over here on the left, the Ele uh, Flex uh, 6700, uh, Elecraft K3S, uh, 10, uh, Kenwood TS890. All these things are, you know, well over 100 dB. Now look at some of these, the, uh, Colin, the old Collins 75S3, the old mill standard. Um, ICOM 756, 706 Mark IIG. These things are in the minus 60, or 60 to 70 dB close in dynamic range. 
huge difference there, 30 to 40 dB, um, which means uh, if you if you have a you know a bunch of these things, you know the 706s or other little portable radios um, that you're using for field day, just because they're portable, well, um, you know you have a good chance of uh, getting your receiver blasted out uh, by uh, strong nearby signals from your other radios. So, you know, if you've got you know, use the best rigs you can gather from your group. Uh, they will make Marty, a difference. Yes. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the radios, these radios are perfectly fine if they're by themselves. The problem is in a field day environment, things are drastically different. I've had people tell me, well, my radio works wonderfully. Well, that's when it's at home and not around yeah, four other radios. Exactly. exactly. And then field day is a situation where, um, you know, unless you're 1A or, you know, 1, 1B, you're going to have multiple radios going and especially if you've got this, a digital station and you got somebody who wants to work CW or sideband. I remember going to one, uh, I used to, you know, as vice director, I used to go around and visit other people's field days. And I did that for many, many years. And I remember going to one where they had folks pretty well spread out in the corners of a huge park. And, um, but I came up to see how they were doing. They said, Oh man, our, you know, the interference between stations is really bad. So I went to the first one. Well, where are you? He said, Oh, I'm on 20 meter sideband. I went to the next one. I said, where are you? So I'm on 20 meter CW. And I went to the third one. Where are you? Well, I'm on 20 meter digital. Okay. I think I figured out your problem guys. Um, now there are ways to alleviate that, but they didn't have the radios that were, the, that were robust enough to handle this sort of stuff or clean enough not to put out, uh, you know, some artifacts uh, of well above or below the operating frequency. Um, there are a number of things you can do with antennas to help uh, reduce the receiver overload side. Um, if physical distance, uh, the, remember there's a thousand foot diameter within which you can operate um, as uh, operate your station as part of the field day rules. So if you have the distance available, use it. Uh, try and get distance between stations, especially in band stations like uh, the go to station, which may be operating on the same band as some of your main ones or having a digital station uh, uh, along with an analog station on say 20 or 15 meters. Um, get those physically separated as best you can. You can use uh, uh, polarization. Uh, now, if you have distance between the stations, you have you know CW station way over here, digital station way over here, uh, that's, that's fine. But if you have your stations all in kind of a cluster uh, to facilitate you know, being close to the food or the facilities, uh, that means you're going to have to separate the antennas further. And that means longer runs of coax. Uh, and that may mean, you know, maybe a little more loss, but, you know, be prepared to try and keep the antennas in particular as far apart as you can. You could use uh, polarization differences. Um, you know, if you use a vertical for one and a horizontal for the other, that'll help. Um, the, uh, if you have, you know, you maybe can combine a day band and a night band in, in one station, uh, but try to you know try to keep the the, the those that are on at the same time of, of the uh, cycle uh, as far apart as you can, and then uh, antenna layout can do a really good job for you if you use it carefully. There, are, you know, every antenna has nulls somewhere. Verticals, of course, their nulls are straight up and down, so that doesn't help you too much. But uh, uh, dipoles, small yaggies little tri-banders, whatever, they all have nulls off the ends. And if you put those dipoles, for example, end to end, so that each one is in the other one's null, that will cut down just the amount of RF that's getting from one transmitter to the other receiver. You know, don't put them concentric where there's one right behind the other and they're looking into each other. Uh, same thing with Yaggies. Put them side by side if you can, rather than in line. As I mentioned, you may be able to do something with the polarization uh, this is from uh, many years ago. This was up on Mount Gleason at 8,000 feet. This is the Caltech JPL field day, W6VIO. I was uh, one of the ops and uh, hardware guys and the climber for that for, for many years. And as you see, we had pretty nice antenna set up, but everything was off, pointing off toward about 70 degrees there. But we had every, everything in the in the uh, lull of the other antennas. And uh, we combined that with some good, uh, you know, some some good clean transmitters, and it worked pretty well. Um, 
there are a number of forms of filtering you can use. Um, the best is to use a good, uh, you know, inductive capacitive type, you know, fixed constant bandpass filters. Uh, they're readily available, uh, low band systems, uh, VA3AM uh, and uh, the W3NQN style. You can build them, you can buy them. Um, when you buy them, I think they run probably 130 bucks a band, something like that, 150 bucks a band. So they're not cheap, but it's a great investment. When we do our de-expeditions, de we've got six kilowatt stations uh, all within you know the, the confines of one piece of property. And we use these along with uh, what are called stub filters, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, to uh, minimize the susceptibility to um, overload from the other stations. Uh, now, these typical LC bandpass filters, most of them are low power. They're made for maybe 200 watts, 150 to 200 watts. So that's perfect for field day in your 100 watt category. Uh, they are made at the kilowatt level. Though obviously, they're bigger, bulkier, more expensive. Uh, but you're not going to be running amplifiers on field day, so you don't have to worry about going to that great extent. Now, stub filters, uh, I mentioned, these are uh, cheap and they're effective. Now, the, the good bandpass filters, they'll give you 50, 60 dB of attenuation out of band. Uh, but the stub filters will knock out harmonics to the tune of maybe 20 to 30 dB, depending on the quality of the coax you're making it with. Um, and I'll show you how to make those in a second. Uh, but remember, whenever you have filters that go uh, with a band, whether it's a, a you know, a radio uh, uh, at the end of the radio transmit filter or whether it's a stub filter, you have to make sure that when you change bands, you change the filter as well. Otherwise, you're going to be transmitting to into what could be a dead short or you could blow up a, a filter. So uh, it's best if you're going to have, say, a station's going to be on uh, uh, 80 at night and 20 during the day. And you're going to have an antenna switch where we'll put the filters on the other side, on the antenna side of the switch, not on the radio side of the switch, so that uh, uh, so that you don't have uh, the possibility of transmitting into something you shouldn't. Now, those stub filters are um, really it's just a T connector at the output of your radio. In this case, it's showing amplifiers because that's where you can use them, but they, they work just fine on the output of your transmitter, your transceiver. Uh, you basically have a stub of it's a, a, a particular fraction of a wavelength. Uh, the basic here's the basic 80 meter stub, um, and it's uh, assuming depending on the kind of coax and the velocity factor, it's going to be uh, uh, 40 to 50 feet, 45, 46 feet, something like that. And you're going to short one end of it, so it's a shorted quarter wave on 80 meters, which means it's high impedance and and it's going to be invisible to your transmitter. Uh, you, it won't even know it's there. But on the even harmonics, which should be 40 and 20 and 15 and 10, um, it's like a dead short, and it sucks it sucks signal out to the tune, uh, transmitted and received, any harmonics, and it'll suck out the other person's received sig uh, signal they're transmitting on, on that band uh, by maybe a factor of 100 or better. So, um, again, cheap to make. Uh, one of my good friends who's actually in the uh, CQ Contest Hall of Fame, uh, my former roommate, called me and he said, uh, hey, uh, I'm having I'm, I'm doing a, you know, multi uh, multi radio single op at home here. And my 20 and 50 meter stations are kind of getting into each other. I said, well, you got 50 feet of coax handy. I said, yep. I said, good. Cut it in half. Uh, you may have to trim it about a foot each uh, short one end of one of them and uh, put it into a T connector and stick that on your 15 meter radio and uh, uh, leave the other one open and stick that on your 20 meter radio through another T connector. And he called back and he said, wow, it problem is gone. So even, even at that level, um, they work great. Let's go to safety for a minute. Uh, first, let's talk about climbing safety. Um, you may not have to climb anything, but as you saw back in that picture, and we had the uh, we had tower trailers and and uh, some people will bring up some stack section and, and guy it. Uh, make sure if you're going to climb, you're only climbing well secured structures. Make sure there's you know well guide or or uh, you know they got outriggers if you need them, whatever, uh, to make sure that it's not going to come over with you on it because you know you you are an asymmetric load when you're climbing that thing. Uh, make sure you have proper protective gear. Um, we, you've seen, uh, if you go back on Rat Pack, you'll see a presentation from, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, proper, you know, climbing safety 
and he talks about the harnesses and everything. I use those with the fall arrest lanyards and so on. It only may, well, it's only 20 or 30 feet, but you can still really hurt yourself. So use the right stuff. Make sure you have a ground crew that's paying attention to you. There should always be somebody with eyes on you when you're up off the ground and uh, uh, they'll be watching to see what's going on and, and uh, be ready to assist if necessary and to uh, send things up or down. If you're going to haul things up, uh, if you're going to use a pulley, uh, try to use a snatch block down at the bottom. Uh, that's like a second pulley. So the rope is uh, attached to your the load you're going to lift. And instead of everybody pulling off to the side where you're going to put side stress on your tower, uh, they're going to pull. Basically, it's going to go through a, a pulley at the bottom, the snatch block. So the force will be at the base, not at the top. So it won't tend to topple it over. Also, that means they can stay well out of the way in case the thing ends up, uh, something falls uh, while you're uh, working up there. Um and only climb when you're rested and it's tough on field day. You know, you're busy getting everything ready and loading up the vehicles. So uh, if you're really beat, don't, that's not a good time to climb. And obviously stay well clear of power lines. Uh, a lot of people use generators for field day. Uh, the the good, good deep cycle batteries are becoming higher in performance and lighter and easier to transport. Uh, a lot of people will use that, but generators are still often used uh, for radios or for some of the accessories, you know, your your area lights, your uh, rotators, if you use them, which we normally don't down here in Southern California, we don't need rotators for field day. You just point everything at 70, but you may be in a position where you do need rotators. Uh, so you'll have uh, generators. Uh, make sure that you keep the generators where the exhaust will be very, very far from and preferably downwind from any tents, cars, or any other enclosures where people will be. Uh, locate those generators and the fuel for them away from any dry brush. Uh, in uh, certainly parts of the southwest here, dry brush is common. And after all the rains we had, it's extremely common. And so you may have to clear an area. Uh, if you can find a concrete pad or something, great. But if not, you may have to you know, bring a hoe and a rake and clear an area uh, so that there's no dry brush sitting around. You absolutely don't want to... Uh, you know, be responsible for uh, lighting that stuff up because uh, you'll never get invited back. That's the least of the problems. Uh, try not to re, uh, if you're, especially if you're using the open frame type generators, uh, you're going to have to, you know, would you have to refuel them, shut them down, let them cool off for a few minutes, tell everybody that, hey, generator's going off for a little bit. Let it cool down, then uh, refuel it carefully, and then you can start it back up again. Uh, make sure you have fire extinguishers properly rated that are near the generator and the fuel and make sure you know how to use those. Those of you who've taken CERT training, you know the point aim squeeze sweep type uh, process for, for fires. Uh, make sure people know how to use those things and have them ready. Uh, store your fuel in good safe containers. Uh, this is not the time for old plastic cans you found in the garage that were 20 years old. Uh, you know, use use good, proper, preferably newer metal containers and uh, check their condition before you load them up. And then you've got to get the AC from the uh, generators out to where your uh, loads are. So make sure you use properly rated cables for outdoors. I use uh, typically SOW. Uh, it's immune to, you know, water and oil and grease and all that. And, you know, you could drive a car over it and nothing's going to happen to it. It's it's. It's big, and you know, I usually use typical uh, three number 10s uh, so that we don't have a lot of voltage drop and uh, route them as best you can to minimize uh, their getting run over, getting you know, tripped on, and so on. Uh, now we go to participant safety. Um, make sure you locate all your tents and anywhere else people are going to be uh, you know, operating or sleeping out of the fall zones of the towers. Um, they, you know, they, chances are they won't fall down, but we've had gusts of wind come up that have, you know, thrown canopies over the top of an RV and, and, uh, we've had trailers come down when people didn't, uh, you know, secure them properly. So make sure you, uh, you don't have a possibility of those things falling on people. Um, use uh, flagging tape. It's cheap. It's highly visible on your guy ropes, cables, wires, anything that might be a either a you know a, 
a choke hazard or a you know run into them at night um you, there are some uh, cables or some uh, line you can use that has reflectors in it those that's pretty cool it's easier to see at night with flashlights uh, make sure you minimize trip hazards that could be uh, tent stakes cables you know ac cables coaxes and so on uh, especially if you're out in the brush or at night it's easy to uh, it's too easy to trip on something and have somebody get hurt so uh, try to keep those uh, to a minimum uh, and you can do that by how you route them and how you mark them uh, make sure at night you have adequate area lighting uh, there's some really nice lighting products out there now with LEDs that don't use a huge amount of power, but they put out a lot of light and uh, you want you want people to be safe at night. Yeah, everybody should have a flashlight, but it's better to have the area uh, reasonably well lit. If there are any uh, dangerous areas or areas that you don't want people to go, uh, use some uh, barrier tape and uh, flag it off. Um, we, uh, we have a, on our uh, ACS field day, we operate up at a, uh, a fire station that has a, a helipad. It's a decommissioned helipad. And we put some of our VHF and UHF stuff up at the helipad. But when you reach out, you know, you go out, uh, you know, 20, 30, 50, 40 yards beyond the helipad itself, uh, it just drops off down down the road. And, you know, as, as, you know, if somebody's wandering around there at night, that could be a problem. So we make sure first to point that out during our safety briefing that we have for everybody that comes and then that we have barrier tape so that nobody gets too close to the edge. The ARL provides a number of bonuses, uh, point bonuses for field day. And one of them is for having a safety officer and that safety officer using a checklist. Uh, this checklist is actually available in the field day packet that you can download from ARRL. And uh, it's a good idea to have somebody keeping an eye on all these issues and making sure that we've covered them all. And again, a good safety briefing is a great way to start uh, when you have people first gathering at your field day site. Um, have suitable first aid resources. Now, it's not just a kit. Everybody's got a first aid kit in their car, I would hope. But make sure you have people knowledgeable on how to use them. Uh, you may also want to make sure you know uh, where is the nearest hospital and how you can raise them, especially you're often kind of a, if you're, if you're up in a, you know, on a hilltop or something, you're not right down in a, in a, in a parking lot somewhere. Uh, where's the nearest hospital? How can you get there? How can you raise them? If uh, EMS, if you need it, uh, hopefully you won't need it, but it's better to be ready and not need it than need it and not be ready. And then finally, uh, you know, now the rules require that all stations have RX, RF exposure calculations done and documented. And of course, field day station, not being a home station, is, uh, is you know, the calcs you do at home uh, won't apply to what you have in the field. So, and you're going to have visitors coming by, uh, maybe uh, officials coming by or visiting hams or members of the public. So, uh, you know, look at look at the RF exposure side and, and uh, document it. And we're going to go over that now. For VHF and UHF, which uh, a lot of people, especially in urban areas, are going to have uh, a, a, an active uh, VHF station on uh, 6 to 220 and so on, um, it's pretty easy to keep the RF exposure below uh, a threshold. And that is uh, keep your antennas raised well above head level and you're going to be fine, whether it's a Yagi or a vertical, you know. Uh, this is not where you want to be operating with the whip on your car as people are walking by because, you know, the, the high current part of that whip is right there where people's heads are. So uh, I tried, uh, uh, I took some calcs for a, a Comet GP3. That's a, a common uh, dual bander for two meters and 440. Uh, figure we put it on a 14 foot mast. Uh, here are the published gains. Uh, now the gain on a vertical, of course, is squishing the pattern down toward the horizon, less less signal going up and down, more going out across. So you can see why you don't want that at head level. You want it up above people's heads. Uh, I contacted Comet uh, because the literature doesn't really cover the uh, the uh, patterns when you're looking across, only when you're looking down. And so here's the vertical radiation pattern on the Comet GP3. I have it for all their other models as well. And of course, 
as the longer you go with more gain, the more squished these become toward that horizon. Here's your horizon right here. Now, here's, uh, let's say we had this up 14 feet. So you got people, say, six feet tall. You got an eight-foot vertical separation. So their heads are down here. Uh, the published gain is going to be at the edge of your graph. And then as you, uh, as you move around at different angles um, and you get inward toward the center, that means uh, attenuation. The less of that signal is going in that direction. As you can see from the bottom, there's almost no signal. You're talking about, oh, what, probably 20 dB or so, a factor of 100 uh, going straight up or straight down. So if you're standing directly under that uh, VHF, UHF vertical, um, you're getting virtually no RF, no significant RF. If you move out, of, out a foot or so, um, you're still getting, look, uh, was this... Uh, so well, probably 10 dB down, factor of a you know factor of 100. Um, and if you're out this way, you have more distance. Uh, you know it's it's not quite as attenuated on the pattern, but you got more distance. So in all these cases, you're just fine. Uh, you know the person standing below is basically safe at any distance. Uh, standing one foot from the mast, you got like six feet of safe space before you get to the un uncontrolled exposure threshold. And standing uh, 14 feet away from the mast, you've got over 15 feet beyond the uncontrolled exposure threshold. So basically, anywhere you stand underneath that raised vertical, as long as it's up fairly high, um, you're going to be good. Uh, what if you're using a VHF beam? Uh, actually, it's just the same. Uh, RF exposure, we say it's well below the thresholds because height adds distance. And distance is good, and gain is directed away from people. The maximum signal is heading off to the horizon over their heads, not toward the people. Uh, if you're using a here's a small uh, a vertical uh, five element or a vertically polarized uh, uh, beam, which you may need to head into your your favored direction. And again, you see as you go off the axis here, the signal drops off considerably. Uh, you know your uh, like the gain is minus four dB. So, you know, it's well below uh, even what a dipole would be. And even more as you get closer to minus 21 dB, minus 30 dB. So you can see that, again, anywhere you are under here, as long as this thing is up a reasonable height, again, I get it up, you know, 15 feet or so, um, you're not going to have any RF exposure issue on your um, on your VHF UHF station. So now about the HF bands because those are the some of the most popularly used uh, in uh, field day. Um, the good news is even though the wavelengths are longer, the allowable power density is much higher on HF than it is on VHF or UHF because it's those 300 400 megahertz signals that tend to penetrate into the body. The HF signals really don't. They just they're they're on the surface. So the uh, what is uh, the FCC considered safe is uh, much higher power density than it was on uh, on VHF or UHF. So I did some um, calculations using the uh, the calculator from uh, Wade Overbeck N6NB. That's November 6 November Bravo dot com. Uh, Wayne was uh, involved in taking the FCC around to study various stations, including his own. Uh, portable stations, fixed stations, when they were first developing the criteria for these RF safety rules back about 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, my station was one of them that was tested. Uh, we tested on multiple bands. Wayne tested it with his portable uh, high power VHF and UHF stations. And uh, Wayne came up with um, a calculator. It's it's an, an old, uh, you know, um, it, it's not a spreadsheet or anything. It's just a you know, you put the numbers in and uh, it tells you the answer. And so I ran this for a typical field day set up for 10 meters. So, okay, let's assume you're running 100 watts, which is kind of the, the limit for the for the power multiplier. On CW or sideband, so you've got maybe a duty cycle of around 35 or 40%. And let's say it's feeding a dipole and you're transmitting 50% of the time. That's pretty aggressive. But if you're really sitting there calling CQ all the time and answering people, you know, that's probably as much as you're ever going to transmit. So when you put those factors in uh, on 10 meters, anything over four feet away from the antenna 
is below the uncontrolled exposure limit. So that's not hard to reach. But what happens when we go to 20 meters? Wavelengths longer. But uh, now, same, same assumptions for a dipole. Um, any distance over two feet away and your calculated power density is below the uncontrolled exposure limit. So what about 80 meters, your nighttime band? Uh, here, again, uh, you know, the frequency is much lower. The impact on the human body is, is much, much lower. So any distance over about a foot from the antenna at 100 watts using these parameters, you're going to be below the uncontrolled exposure limit. So I think that's pretty good news. Uh, you know, people have been concerned about having folks wander around when you've got RF floating around. And it wouldn't hurt to actually uh, use that calculator, print out the results, and you'll have them uh, when, uh, you know, legally you're supposed to have it anyway. We know the FCC is not going to check, but if somebody comes around and questions it or complains, you can actually show them that, yes, we pay attention to this stuff. We've done the calculations. Here's the printout. Here's the safe distance. And as you can see, uh, we have nobody anywhere uh, near enough to, to cause a problem based on our antenna placement and our antenna height. And I've placed the link for the calculator in the chat. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and one thing that we, we try to mention, and we didn't last time, um, anytime you're out on a deployment uh, or field day or anything else, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with the unknowns. Uh, you're going to run into some new situations. So it's a good idea to keep track of what worked, what didn't. I usually have a pad next to me. Uh, when I'm operating, I'm logging on computer, but I keep a pad with some notes. And if something is working particularly well or not working particularly well, or we need this to solve this problem for next year, I keep the notes and that becomes kind of my punch list for the next time. And oh, I've, those punch lists have resulted in some real improvements over time in ease of setup, in uh, safety, in uh, effectiveness of the station. So uh, get all your participants to keep notes. Uh, try to gather those notes as soon after the end of uh, the event as possible while things are fresh in their minds. Um, get them recorded. And then use those comments as part of your planning for next year. Ideally, you know, something that was an issue last time, hey, we came up with a solution. Uh, you could try it out. And if it works, then good. That becomes part of your new, uh, your new standard uh, process. Uh, and that may cause you to reevaluate the hardware you're using, uh, the strategy, the layout, and those changes can really help you out. So that's about what I've got. I'm going to unshare. Let's see if there are questions up to this point and then see what Anthony would like to chip in on. I see Scott uh, uh, mentions in the chat, uh, uh, avoid sodas and energy drinks. Yeah, yeah you know, water maybe with some uh, electrolytes in it is great. Uh, and you do want to stay hydrated. Some field days sites are, it's very hot. People are walking around or lifting things, hauling cables, working up a sweat. So absolutely keep them hydrated. That's probably the, the number one nutritional recommendation. Thank you, Scott. Okay. And Anthony, you've got your screen up there. Well, he's trying to. Okay, but he's muted. Yeah. Unmute, you're, Anthony. You're muted, Anthony. Oh, he may be. He may be talking to someone. Okay, no, I couldn't get the button. I had another window covered up the button. Oh. <laughs> so what I have tonight today is I have a few resources that I put together that I wanted to share with you that you're welcome to use for field day, and I'll give you a link. Uh, at the end here to get to all of these. But the first one, uh, you can see the link here, and I'll put this link in the chat. This is a poster, and you can change this. When you go click on the link, you're going to get information to make a copy. It's going to ask you to make a copy. And the reason is that allows you to edit it so you can put your information for your field day site in there. But basically, this is something we do on 11 by 17. We're going to laminate it, put it out so people can see it. And it talks about inviting people to go to, then it talks about basically how our contacts work. And before we even talk about how the contact works, I give them a little bit of warning that we're going to use phonetics, cue signals, section list, which will have a field day class, that which we're going to be using for our exchange and that information, a basic step-by-step -step of what a contact sounds like, a little graphic display of what a contact looks like, 
and then tips for the operator. Anytime I make handouts, I always put a QR code so that anyone that wants a copy can shoot, simply shoot the QR code and that gives them a copy of this document. So this is one example. So this is field day resources. This will get you access to all the things I started showing in the, including the go to thing, tiny.cc slash FD resource. And I'll put this in the chat also. And this will get you that first document plus the rest of the ones I'm going to be showing. So the documents are the poster, which I already showed, a set of uh, section abbreviations, And this is set up on two pages. You can print them on one page and flip it over. You can print two separate pages. And what this basically has, the first side has the sections listed by the call area for both U.S. and Canada. And then it has the section name and the abbreviations for each of the sections. By the way, there's some new ones this year. Uh, the Greater Toronto Area is now gone, GTA, and it's now the Golden Horseshoe. Uh, so just be aware of that. Also on this list, it has some common cue signals, phonetic alphabet. On the other side of the page, it has the sections listed alphabetically and uh, has, has the name and the abbreviations for them in the same phonetic alphabet on this side. The next resource is a um, section map. And again, you're... You don't really need this, but these are also very good for not only station operating tools, but these are good for your education table and to explain to the public and to any visiting officials what's going on. There's nothing better than being able to show them something while you're talking to illustrate what you're trying to explain to them. So this shows you what all the sections are. The next one on the list here is a handout that's designed mainly for youth, but it works for any public visiting. It's called the Ham Radio Resources for Visitors, Youth, Students, and Teachers. Again, we create these. We laminate. This is 11 by 17. They can shoot one barcode and take the whole thing home with them, or they can shoot the barcode for each individual item they'd like to view. On the back of this, or on a separate page, depending on how you want to do it, we have basically explaining what is field day, uh, and explaining the different classes of stations. And then the final item on this list, and I may add more to this as I come up with new things. I'll just put them on this same list here so you'll have them. This is information on sending home the visitors with a radio that they can listen to. This has online software-defined radios. They can listen to them at the field day site and see what's going on with field day, or they can use this later. So scan the QR code. This is a uh, a version of the one I use for my school uh, students, and it talks about, so they could get these uh, software-defined radios, basically how to use it, and then it has the amateur radio bands listed, and it also has typical field day exchange uh, and other types of things going on here, so they would know to what to be listening for when they hear it. So those are just some resources, and again, tiny.cc slash field day I'm sorry, FD-RES, and I put that in the chat. The next thing I wanted to talk about was a couple last-minute logging and software issues that you might want to remember or know about. So you may this may be secondhand to many of you, but if you're going to be using FT8 and FT4 with WSJTX, you want to make sure you go in and make a couple small changes in the settings. So you go to File, Settings, so on our settings, under the general tab, if you're not going to be using your call sign, if you're going to be using a different call sign for your club, make sure you change the call sign and the grid. You need to change those two items on the general tab. On the advanced tab, you need to change something for the field day exchange. So you need to come down here where it says special operating activity, choose that checkbox, then choose the AWRL field day tab. Then you need to come over here in this top box, ignore the second box, that's for, for the ready uh, exchange. In this top box, you need to put in your uh, number, your class, and a space, and then your section. I'm going to be two Bravo in West Virginia, but you would put in whatever you're going to be doing. 
click the OK button, and you'll be all set to go. I'm going to uncheck this because I'm not going to be operating field day from this particular computer. But you need to do those two things. The third thing I want to mention about WSJTX and FT8, if you're if you're running it and you're not using that particular computer for anything else, I would just run it by itself. I would not try and interface it with other logging software. It just gets complicated. It's very easy after the contest to simply go file, open log directory, go in and find your log underscore, I'm sorry, WSJTX underscore log dot ADI file, open it up. And before you do anything at all with it, very, very important. Save it with a new name. That'll make a copy of that file that you can use. Then you can just take the section from that time period and import it into whatever logging software you're going to be using to create your final report for field day. So those are just three little tips for uh, operating WSJTX for field day. The other thing you want to do, and this is also very important, don't wait until field day to learn how to use FT8, FT4. Uh, train your people a little bit ahead of time if they don't already know. can be very helpful to do that. Also, don't forget about FT4 in addition to FT8. It's got a slower time. It's got a much quicker time, about half the time to make contacts. You lose a little bit of signal strength capability, but it also will be very handy. You notice right now I'm on 15 meter, I'm sorry, 17 meter uh, FT8, and it's filling up the whole screen. If I would switch over to FT4, you'll notice about half as many people. So you may want to consider thinking about FT4 in addition to FT8. Next thing I wanted to mention was a couple things in N1MM, which is a very popular logging software for field day. Again, a couple small changes you need to do. The first one is you need to change your station configuration. So to go to config and then go to change your station data. Again, you need to put in whatever call sign you're going to be using. The only other thing you need to change is the section. You can change the rest of this, but you don't have to, to be able to get the right uh, information. But you do need to make sure you change that call sign right there and the section. Now, to set up the software for field day, you need to go in and say file, uh, new new log file, and you need to create a file that's choose the FD for field day. And then you need to do some setup in there. That includes putting in your section ex section I'm sorry, your class and number and your section. The operator call sign here is not the one that's going to be using for any macros or anything you generate. It'll be using the one you set up in that configuration. So very important to do that. Then each time a new operator sits down, they should either type in op on and type in their call sign. That won't be sent out over the air, but that'll be recorded in the log for your records. Or they can simply do a, contr a control O and it'll bring up the same window and they can type in their call sign. So train your, your operators when they sit down, the first thing they always need to do is a control O. So those are just a couple things that I had and I'll be happy to take any questions on either the handouts or on the software. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share here. And, Anthony, uh, I've got a question. Yes, go right ahead. Um, yeah, uh, with the uh, FT4 and FT8, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't do those modes, but is, we are going to have somebody doing it. Uh, is there a way to tell by listening on the band, which mode people are on? Because, you know, yeah, I mean, actually, I, there, yes, there is. Uh, let me just, let me show you quickly on that. I'll bring the share back up. Let's bring up that, um, because one is longer than the other one, you can tell by looking at how long the signals are on the screen. So if you bring up the waterfall and just look at the activity, you'll see the activity here. And even if you're not decoding, you can see when it starts and see the timer that's going across right here. Mm -hmm. On FT8, it's 15 seconds, and then it switches over to the next time segment. On FT4, it's seven seconds. Also, the tones sound a little bit different. The tone is higher pitched for FT8 than it is for FT4. Okay. So whichever mode you're in, you will see both modes of operation on your yeah. waterfall. Well, no, you, no, you well, you only see it if people are in the wrong place. The good news is, though, when you choose FT8 or FT4, when you choose the drop down menu to pick the frequency, it will pick the right one. So on 40 meters right now, 
it put me on 7.074, which is the frequency for FT4, FT8. If I click the FT4 button, watch what happens to the frequency. It changes to the FT4 frequency, which is 7.0475. Ooh, which is really close to the CW band. <laughs> yes, that that's a that's a very poor choice on that. And I would I would suggest that you operate your FT4 more on 20 at 15 and 10. So let's see what happens when we do it on on ten on twenty. Now we switch over to twenty, and I'm sorry about N one I'm popping up, but um, so now we're on fourteen point oh eight oh, which is the FT four frequency. If I click the FT eight button, it will switch it to fourteen point oh seven four zero. So okay, tell your good. operators to always okay. use the drop down. Don't try and type the frequency in or spin the dial or anything like that, and that should get them on the right one. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. That'll be helpful. Oh, you're welcome. And as far as the handouts, there's one other, uh, not for the public, but for your operators. Uh, and that is whatever logging program you're using on the computers, uh, have a little cheat sheet with some of the most common things on it. Uh, like if you start typing and you make a mistake, how can you back up and correct it? Or uh, do you have to hit Alt W to wipe out and start over? Uh, or if you enter the log, enter it, and it's incorrect, how do you go back and make a correction? Yes. And that'll vary a little bit. I suggest a set of, set of keyboard, and, keyboard shortcuts and instructions for each of the things they need to do with the particular logging software. I did a presentation last year on uh, using N1MM for field day, and that's available at tiny.cc slash N1MMFD. Uh, and that's that presentation is available uh, both the slide presentation and recorded versions of it are also available. So I'll post that in the chat here in a moment. So that's on the Rat Pack archive as well, right? Yes, that's on the Rat Pack archive as well. Uh, All right, great. Day, uh, or you could just search for KZT and uh, N1MM for field day. That'll get yeah. you information. The other most common program is N3FJP, and I've done some some presentations on that, but not as extensive. Um Really, the biggest thing is I try and suggest to people have your potential operators work the West Virginia QSO party the Saturday before or mm -hmm. operate in the AWRL VHF UHF contest this weekend. There's two great training opportunities coming up. If you can convince them to try out the logging software during either one of those, it'll really help things out. And the AWRL VHF UHF contest is a great time to try out FT8 and FT4 because there'll be a lot of activity on six meters and two meters. You do need to change this one little setting for that, though. You're going to go to the settings, and under this advanced category, you're going to choose the special operating mode, but you're going to pick North American VHF for that, as opposed to the AWRL field day, if you operate this coming weekend for the VHF UHF contest. Other questions? Oh, hands are up. I don't see anything in chat. How are you doing, Barry? Everything's good in chat. Some good advice from Scott. If everyone wants to read it. And I would definitely go back to, to uh, if you didn't catch our field day presentation already uh, on Rat Pack, it was about a month ago, go back and take a look at that. You can also go back and, and find the one on N1MMM for field day. That was last year. You can find that one available. So take a look at those pieces of information. And Michelle, if no one has any questions. Save often for your computer stuff. Well, I just want to mention a little, couple little strategy type things. And again, it's not a contest, but it's always nice if you can do fairly well. And a couple of things I learned last year when I was field day chairman for one of many times that I've done it. One of the most important things, just like any type of contest activity, is butt in the chair. So you spend all this time getting these stations set up. Make sure you have operators scheduled on paper with backups to work all the times throughout the whole contest. It's really a shame when you set everything up and then everyone decides at 8.30, oh, it's getting dark. I think I'm done for the night. I'll see you in the morning. And you put all that effort in. So really think about that. The other thing I figured out last year, a really simple thing to help increase the, the participation, I made it so each of the stations could look out their door or window 
of their tent or trailer or whatever they were in, and they could see the food tent. That mm -hmm. also meant that from the food tent, we could see what stations were not being operated. So if I was at the food tent and someone was sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, I might suggest, hey, go uh, over there. The digital station's open. No one's operating it. So in the past, we always faced all the doors in one direction, and no one could see any of the other operators. So by having them all face the food tent area, we could now determine whether there was an operator in the chair and operating. Uh, Carolyn, right, go ahead. Carolyn has her hand up there. Yeah, my my question is, what is the the mi the minimum distance between antennas that won't cause interference? It's all relative. There's there's no there's no magic distance. Um, you know, the, it's more orientation. Again, yeah, placement orientation is probably more important. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would say, you know, if if you can get, uh, well, like on, on uh, uh, our ACS uh, field day, uh, we're going to have some people doing digital, and they'll probably on, be on the same bands as as our other stations. So we're going to put them at the far other end of the parking lot, uh, well within the uh, the legal distance for the contest, but it's going to be uh, considerably farther than you know if they were at the the pad next to us or something so uh you know there's there is no magic distance uh, every all the distance you put helps a little bit but all the 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 orientation and the filtering and the other stuff we talked about probably makes the biggest difference and there's a there's a question in the in the comments uh with stub filters is it okay to coil the stub cable in my yeah. experience it is matter of fact you can put it in a box if you want you can put it in a in a plastic pill and carry it out there yeah we we uh <clears throat> our stub filters are all uh coiled up for transport and then when we deploy them uh when i i built a full set <clears throat> i put about four feet of uncoiled uh at the uh at the radio end and then i use uh zip ties or whatever so that the weight of the coil sitting on the floor behind the desk and not pulling down on the on the connector but other than that yeah, you can coil them up. And that brings up another little thing that a lot of people don't realize. When you bring that coax into the structure where you're going to have, I always try and tie it off in some way so that if someone trips on that outside, it won't yank the radios off the table. <laughs> uh, Good point. So I, I, I either wrap it around a leg and then use uh, Y ties. I use clamps. I use something. Uh, so that it's going to not be able to yank the radio off the table when someone trips over it. And really, you know, in the daylight when we're setting up, we for forget about how liable we are to trip on things at night when people are stumbling around. People are tired. They can't see well. They might have not been there when we set up the station. So don't just assume because it was obvious that there was a trip hazard during the daytime. People at night won't see that trip hazard. Yeah, that's where that good area lighting will help. Uh, one of our members has a uh, uh, several of these big uh, Milwaukee area lights that run off their uh, their 18 volt batteries. They stack a bunch of batteries around there. They runs all night. It really lights the area up well. And anywhere that people are likely to be uh, transitioning from one location to another, uh, it's it's well lit. So we don't you know we don't we don't uh, make we don't make it easy <laughs> to be in the dark. Also, when you're putting your laying your generator out, if you can make sure that the exhaust is pointing away from your station, it minimizes the noise. We're lucky in that we have a little rise in our our uh, topology at our site that our club uses that we can put it over the slight rise. So there's really about a four foot dirt bank embankment between the generator and most of our stations, and it really helps kill the noise of the generator somewhat. Oh yeah, and if if you if there's a building or a wall or something, you can put them on the other side of that. If it's if it's clear of brush and safe to do, uh, that's even better. Yeah, that that uh, fortunately the good you know the good uh, inverter type generators are fairly quiet, especially uh, if you run them on eco mode, which usually you can do on field day. So the noise levels are not significant once they're uh, at a safe uh, uh, vapor distance from from the uh, from the operating places. But yeah, anything you can do to uh, quiet it down is good. Speaking of quieting it down, uh, you should encourage all your operators to use headphones. And yes. a lot of people don't like to share yes. headphones, so bring your own. Have everybody bring their own. Make sure it's uh, the plugs are compatible. And bring plenty of Ys. 
why is it uh, very important to have the splitters if you want to be able to let other people listen? If you want other people to listen, or in the case of my K3, I just push a button and I can have speakers, the speaker yep. plus the headphones, and I can push another button and silence it. But the reason, two reasons for the headphones. One is you'll hear better with less distraction of the noise around you. And that means you can run the radio at a lower volume, which means less ear fatigue. And the other is uh, what you're hearing is not going to bother the operator trying to hear a weak signal at the next tenth or whatever it is. So, um, you know, I remember one station that had like 15 transmitters and nobody was wearing headphones and it was like the Tower of Babel. My God. So I, <laughs> I suggested to them that they they start investing in some having people bring headphones. And uh, the next time I visited them next year, it was a night and day difference, just really quiet compared to what it had been. So um, make sure... It, Again, you know, people bring their own phones. Most of them are, you know, the 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 typical radio headphones have quarter inch mono or quarter inch stereo um, uh, plugs. Um, a lot of the newer headsets have uh, uh, three and a half millimeter or one eighth inch uh, stereo plugs. Uh, have a few adapters handy, but uh, you know, the headphones will make your operation a lot better. And by the way, I also encourage using foot switches. And boom mics, um, again, less less clutter on the table, uh, and it keeps your distance between your voice and the microphone more consistent and uh, just less hassle. And, you know, when you mentioned the K3, that reminded me of something. Uh, this is a little esoteric, but if you are one of the N1MM users and you know how to program in macros, you can program macros that not only send ex exchanges, but I have one when I hit it, it automatically zero beats my K3. So by knowing the various commands for different radios, you can actually put those into the N1MM macros and have them do things like turn off a speaker or uh, zero beat the radio. So you can actually do it from the keyboard. And there's plenty of extra keys available that you don't necessarily use on the N1MM macros all the time. So you can devote one. Uh, John K7BSV has a question. Uh, yeah, this is John K7BSV. I'm up here in North Idaho. And uh, yeah, we're working and we've been doing a lot of work for field day. We're going to be using stubs and various things. Uh, we've even got to the point where with not only headsets, we're actually going to have uh, some of these blankets you can hang in your, tra in your trailers so that you can uh, knock down the noise. Uh, uh, we had a guy who's a, a former artilleryman who uh, decides he likes to scream and uh, broke the eardrums out of the poor guy with the headset on next to him. So we're working on that to take care of those little challenges. Well, by the way, if you need to put two stations together, remember the FT8, FT4 station is compatible with any other station because there's no noise being made from it. Right, yeah, we're going to have an SSB station uh, within about six feet of a uh, an FT4, FT8 station, but... Uh, we just want to make sure the poor guys running the FTH station don't lose their hearing. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably what happened to the artillerymen in the first place. <laughs> yeah, the cannon, cannons have a detrimental effect on your ears. I can, I can attest to that. Yeah. Any other questions? Please feel free to raise your hand. Marty and I will answer any, any strange question you might have about field day. We have many years of weird field day experience between us you know i'm already i forget about generators because when i'm operating on my own i'm always operating battery power so I yeah i do i do too but years. i do too but you know sometimes they have it to, to run uh, facilities yeah. in the camp kitchen if there is one uh again uh, some some area lighting is is not battery and uh also if you're using a computer for logging that is not being used to generate digital signals it does not have to be on emergency Correct. power. Uh, and in fact, that, you know, often people will plug those into the generator just uh, because, uh, you know, the logging, the, the logging computer battery typically won't last 24 hours without uh, without keeping charged up. I got a little book book uh, sized battery that keeps my laptop running all weekend. But uh, by the way, if you're the person bringing the computer out and other people are going to be using it, even if it has a trackpad, remember that some people have impossible ability of using 
trackpad, so you might want to bring a mouse with you. And if it's a small screen, you might want to think about an external monitor uh, for that. I know that, that that was our two most common complaints last year. And as it is every year, people sit down at the computer and there's a trackpad and the person using the computer like myself has no problem using the trackpad, but other people might find it awkward. So having a spare mouse with you and possibly an external monitor might be very helpful for the yeah time. and if you're out in the open uh like on a, a park bench oh, or yes. <laughs> table or something you'll probably want some sort of little cover just make it out of a cardboard box but something to uh, shield the uh screen because most screens aren't bright enough for daylight and you can get to where you can't see what you're entering and uh so g give yourself give yourself some extra visibility on that screen with some sort of shield see uh, someone uh someone said it's hard it, in field day it's hard to work stations with so many awesome ham stations participating well one of the tricks is if you have the flexibility of having of using multiple bands that really can be helpful check out the other bands spend some time on 10 uh also remember if you're doing a one a, a, a two a or three a or four a station or some of the other categories, you can have a free VHF UHF station with no extra count of station numbers. So there are ways to increase your operating uh, ability to make contacts by spreading out a little bit. Yeah, and I see uh, John KD7 NHC is on. John's the uh, uh, section emergency coordinator for, coordinator for Nevada. Uh, glad, glad to see you, John. And he he mentions that uh, operating the pileups are fun. And yes, you can generate pileups, and especially for more experienced operators. That's that's really the way to go when the band is open. If you can find a spot and hang on to it and just call CQ and run the stations, uh, your rate will go up considerably. And, uh, you know, the stations will come to you. And as long as you keep it short, uh, make sure that your exchange is crisp. You don't throw in a lot of extra words. Uh, then, then people who hear you operating with somebody, working with somebody, know that they won't have to wait very long before it's their turn, and they'll stick around for you. So don't go, don't say please copy with your exchange. Just give them the exchange, call sign exchange, and go, and that's it. And you don't have to repeat theirs. You just say yours. And uh, you know, if, if if Anthony says I'm, you know. Uh, 2B West Virginia, and I just say, uh, Roger, you know, 3 Alpha Los Angeles, and that's it. That's all you have to say. Yep. And then, uh, you know, thanks, QRZ, and your thank, you know, thanks in your call sign. Also, when you're, when you're, if you need a fill, in other words, if you miss something, ask them specifically for what you want. Don't ask for, just don't say repeat or again. If you miss the exchange only, just ask for the exchange again. And you can do that in both CW or phone very easily. And if yeah, they say, ask for say again your part, class, say again yes. your section. And if they ask for just one part, don't give them everything again. If you think it's going to be marginal, it's better off to give them the piece of information they asked for twice as opposed to sending the whole thing over and over again. Right. And if they have your call correct, don't give them your call phonetically a second time when they come back to you. If, if somebody's running and uh, you put in a call and they come back to you correctly, um, you don't have to give your, you really don't have to give your call again. And you know, certainly don't give it phonetically, keep it short. The faster it is, the fa happier everybody's going to be. And be aware that if the station that's running, the, the, the CQing station, the running station repeats your information back to you, that means they're asking you. So give them a quick Roger or a QSL. <laughs> don't repeat it back again, because that'll just confuse matters. They'll think that maybe they had it wrong. So if yeah. I come back and say uh, to Marty N6VI, He's not going to repeat N6VI. He's going to give me a Roger or a QSL, and then I yeah. know I got it right, and we really save a lot of time. And I, I always hear that on the air during contests. Someone will uh, – the, the calling station will repeat asking the, if the information is correct, and the person will just repeat the information again exactly the way they said it. Then there's question as to whether they got it right because they're repeating something to me. Carol yeah. has a yeah. Carolyn has a question. Yeah, can you use more than one radio on the go to station as long as they're not transmitting simultaneously? 
Absolutely. You could have multiple radios for any of the stations and you might, you know, that actually could be a good way to get things set up. Sometimes you might have one radio that you want to use on CW or you might have one you want to use on phone at the same loc- same station because maybe you're switching over and you're not going to run CW or phone. You can have multiple stations as long as you're not running them. So the way the class, num- the way the number that's attached to the class is calculated, it's the maximum number of transmitters that you have on it at any one time with the exception of the GOTA station and the VHF UHF station. So you can always switch. Let's say you're running 2A and you want to concentrate on both on CW phone and data. You can switch one of those two stations out at any time. And by the way, remember the GOTA station has to use a different call sign. It can't use the call sign of the station of the, 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 the main station, but it uses the same identical exchange so even though there's only one go to station if they're working with a five alpha station they would still give their exchanges five alpha even though they're using a different call sign ah oh, okay and john k7 uh, bsv again go ahead no yeah, one, one comment i know on when we did the idaho qso party one thing i did was uh, other people made obviously are going to do it differently but I, I was very deliberate when I sent my call sign up front and then said QRZ that tried to give people sufficient time to just uh, type in whatever, type in my call sign, because I'm assuming that they are probably going to be using some kind of, uh, you know, computer software. And I think I had out of 600 plus contacts, my body finally could just gave up. <laughs> Uh, I had one that we had to go back and uh, make it a, do it again to figure out who I was. So <laughs> by slowing yeah. down a little bit, it seemed to speed me up. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's a good point. Yeah. And uh, uh, also, I I've heard a few people who really aren't clued in. They will put a long CQ 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 field, and then they'll give their call once. Okay. Yeah. Give your call okay. More. That, that's not helpful at all to anybody. It, you're tying up the band and you're not giving useful information. You know, one CQ field day is more than enough and give your call two or three times, uh, you know, maybe with phonetics then without phonetics and then stand by and see what comes back. Uh, as far as logging goes, if you're going to do any kind of operation, I would strongly, strongly suggest you use computer logging. If you're not comfortable or you have someone in your club that's not comfortable, the trick is get on during a contest between now and then. You don't need to get on the air with a radio. Simply fire up the computer logging software, find a station that's running, in other words, calling CQ, and pretend you're logging for them. And that'll give you all the practice you want with the logging software without tying up your brain thinking about making contacts. So just practice logging by having another station be the actual station running. And it's a great way to learn the logging software without the pressure of making the contacts. I might add something else here. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is during the weekend of field day, I will open up Rat Pack and you can on uh, Zoom. So if you guys, when you're off, you want to share things or find out things, uh, Coming into our pack just like you did tonight over that weekend, see who's there and maybe, uh, you know, and share some information and help each other. Yeah, and if you have All any right, questions, Marty and I would be happy to answer any questions between now and field day. So just drop us an email uh, and we'll try and answer questions. Yeah, you can use our calls at ARRL.net. Yep. That works. Any other questions from anyone? Marty, I'm going to send you a radiogram. All right, that's fine. <laughs> Great. That's good. Direct all radiograms to K7REX, King of the Rat Pack. <laughs> well, thank you. Make sure you put that in the text. King of the Rat Pack. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everybody for the good questions and the good suggestions. And uh, uh thanks, Anthony, for for your uh your piece of this. Appreciate it much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the, all the safety. That's The safety is the boring part until something happens, and then you wish you would have spent more time on the safety. No one ever regrets doing the safety uh, 
when you see what could happen to someone now, else. Remember, I, I was a CPA for many years, so I concentrated on the boring stuff all my life. Yes. <laughs> and, and my rule about electricity and antennas is I need to be twice the distance that, of the length of whatever conductor I have at a minimum. You can never be too far away. And by the way, just a, another quick reminder about safety. Even though it's not an electrical pole or electric line, if it has a light on top of it, if it has any type of electrical utility on it, it could be a hot metal pole. So you need to stay away from light poles, yeah. uh, loudspeakers, anything that might potentially have electrical current running through it. Extremely good presentation. Lots of good information tonight. Thank you, both of you. Great. Well, listen, you guys have a wonderful field day. Everybody enjoy yourselves. Be safe. And uh, we hope to work many of you on the bands. To Bravo, West Virginia. <laughs>